for a moment. We'll be right with you. Hey, there's a lovely image. I look way better. I probably sound better now, too. Let me just check with uh, my technical director. Can you hear anything? I can see deflection in my microphone input now. And we are good. OK, folks, now that we're good, let me just check and make sure we're live, and then we'll go from there. What's our status, Joy? We are live. Oh, wait, I think I heard your voice. Hey, hello from York, Pennsylvania. Hi, York, Pennsylvania. Uh, Alan, if you'll hold with this, hold on with us for just one second. We're just, oh, I think we're all good. The universe has come together and conspired to work for us this evening. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer, here with the August 2023 edition of Night Skies at Home. Glad to have you with us this evening. Let us know where you're listening to the program from. We'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, joining me tonight, of course, our technical director, Joy, is off in the uh, ether someplace, helping us in the background. Thanks very much, Joy. Greatly appreciate it. And our studio producer is here. My wife, Linda, she's sitting over here. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you all heard that. Linda says hi. And uh, our program tonight is going to give us all the information we need to know to observe the night sky here in what is now becoming late summer. It's actually just past midsummer, so things aren't so far out yet. But there's a lot happening in the sky, plenty for us to see, and we're going to go through some of what we can see now, and we're also going to cover what's going to be visible to us over the next month or so. Uh, so you'll have plenty of information you can use to get a good look at the night sky while the weather is still nice and warm, actually. Now, uh, when I say nice and warm, of course, that's a relative thing. In some parts of the country, maybe even where you are, temperatures are really warm, like actually hot. And uh, we hope you get some relief soon from the very, very high temperatures. And uh, for those of us that may be in an area of the country that's slightly cooler, uh, we still have time to get outside and enjoy the night sky. So there's enough for everybody. Uh, anything you might be interested in, I should say it this way. There's always something of interest to see in the evening sky for everyone. So we'll talk about a few of those things. And our major topic tonight, then sort of like the main topic tonight, is actually about careers in astronomy. Careers in astronomy. Most people think of astronomy as a, as a career base as pretty narrow. You do one thing. You put your eye up to the eyepiece of a telescope and you look through, right, and make discoveries, right? It's way more than that, so much more than that. And we'll talk about that this evening as part of our program. We'll also talk a little bit about what's happening in October of this year. There's a very special event coming in October. We'll talk a little bit about that because we'll be saving most of that for September and October. And at the same time, uh, we'll also give you a little update on things that are happening in the sky, things you might want to know about, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the Perseid meteor shower. I'll talk a little bit about the Perseid meteor shower that's happening this month and give you the information you need to know. So again, I'm Derek Pitts, the chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum. Cool astronomer is the Twitter handle. Oh, wait, Twitter. I think it's now X, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's what I go by, cool astronomer. And feel free to reach out to me at the Franklin Institute if you have questions about astronomy. And speaking of questions, one of the things we really love to do is we love to take your questions here on the program. So if you have questions about astronomy, whatever we're talking about this evening, or general questions about astronomy, the night sky, space exploration, Anything that's related to that, we'll be happy to talk about that. So uh, just let us know. Send us a note. And my studio producer, Lindy, here will uh, send me a note and let me know what's up. She won't send me a note. She'll just yell across the room, basically. So, uh, But we'll get your message one way or the other. So again, this is the August 2023 version of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is a product of the Franklin Institute Science Museum, where I work, and uh, we do this as a service to you so that you'll have the information you need to know to connect with the universe. We all have some feeling of connection to the universe, whether it's 
large because we're deeply interested in astronomy, or we just like to go outside and look up every now and then. It still helps for you to have a little bit of information about what that is. So in a sense, I'm just kind of vamping here as we give people a chance to join our program tonight. So thanks for uh, bearing with us as we straighten out some technical issues, which we have all straight. Thank you very much, Joy. And uh, we're kind of ready to get started. Don't forget, let us know where you're listening to the program from and if you have questions. In fact, as it turns out, my studio producer has something here. She says, wow, we have Alan in York, Pennsylvania. Hi, Alan. Thanks for sticking with us while we got the technical stuff straightened out. Anthony from Delaware. Yes, the first state. Hi, Anthony. Hope your skies are good down there. Minda in Seattle. Oh, my gosh. What a fabulous connection. Hi, Minda. I really appreciate seeing you here this evening. I know just who you are. And uh, you know what? I was actually just talking about you, Minda, about three weeks ago. So you're in my mind. Don't worry. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. How's your family out there, by the way? Okay, great. Isabel from Junietta Park in North Philadelphia. I know where that is. I grew up not too far from there. Luke in the house from Allentown. Hi, Luke. Thanks for joining us. And Nick up in Nashua, New Hampshire. Great, Nick. Happy to have you aboard. Nashua has a soft spot in my heart because it's actually the home of a really, really cool planetarium equipment company. This is a group that makes the best planetarium equipment in the world and has co-produced along with me one of the best planetarium shows ever created. You can see anywhere called Two Space and Back. And uh, so I've been to Nashua a few times. So thanks for joining us from Nashua. Happy to see you. And uh, welcome to everybody else who's joining us tonight. So all right, folks, here, let's do this. Now that we've had a little bit of an introduction, uh, let's really get started with the content of our program this evening. Uh, you can see I have this wonderful image behind me. Uh, this is an image from uh, James Webb Space Telescope, and it really is a gorgeous image. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, these space telescopes are doing such incredible work because if you look at the detail in these images, it's just amazing how detailed they are. And this is this is a high resolution image, but it's being presented in this system tonight, you know, kind of like at a zoomed out distance. If you actually go to the James Webb Space Telescope and look through the gallery of images, you can pick this one up. This is the Eagle Nebula, actually, and you've seen this before from Hubble Space Telescope, and it was called the Pillars of Creation. Well, this is that Eagle from the Eagle Nebula, and if you can zoom into this, you'd be amazed at the incredible amount of detail. But I have to tell you, you have to read the caption that explains all that you're seeing here. And once you kind of look at that and read that a few times, then you begin to realize how complex astronomy can be and how many different kinds of people it takes to bring us an image like this and the kind of work it takes to interpret an image like this, to, to give us sort of like the straight skinny on what's going on in this. And it's a miraculous, miraculous story. And all of what you see here is just a small piece of what some of the careers are in astronomy that you can, uh, that you that you could possibly pursue if you're interested. So if there's somebody in your household that thinks they're interested in a career in astronomy, or you wanna take some notes about this, please do. And I'll even give you a source, a link that you can go to where you can read about this sort of stuff in detail. Okay, great. All right. Fabulous. I can't believe Mind is here. Hi, Minda. Great to see you. Okay, so let's uh, get on with sky phenomena for what's happening this month. You know how we go through what's going on in the sky right now. Well, here's what's going on in the sky right now. Sunrise now is coming at 6.01 a.m. 6.01 a.m. Nice and early, right? Uh-uh, guess what? We have lost a half an hour of sunlight already from the summer solstice. Here we are at August the 3rd, just a couple of months ago on June 21st, sunrises were coming at something like 5.15 in the a.m. Uh, we've lost a lot of time already. So we're in that portion of the summer now where we really start to see that we're losing minutes of sunlight during the day. Okay, we've already reached the culmination of the greatest number of hours of daylight for the northern hemisphere. And now we're headed back down again, if you will. You'll first notice it, of course, in the evening as sunsets begin to come earlier. Sunset this month, or actually tomorrow, is at 8.11 p.m. 8.11. Two months ago, it was 8.31. 
So it really looks like we're losing a lot of time here. And then we'll start to lose minutes. Oh, we've already started to lose minutes on the front end of the day where sunrise is coming later. So we've got the squeeze happening now, folks, where we're losing minutes of sunlight on the end of the day, losing minutes of sunlight in the morning, and the hours of sunlight are beginning to shrink. So uh, you can see what's happening with that. Uh, but it's all part and parcel of the Earth's orbit around the sun. This is the cycle that happens every year and leads to the seasons we have and a lot of the seasonal celebrations too. So all part of the physics of Earth going around the sun. The moon right now is at a waning gibbous, waning gibbous, meaning it's just past full, not quite to last quarter, waning gibbous, listening from San Francisco. Hey, Juwan, how are you? Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, all this information is good for you out there too, by the way. Uh, and uh, with a waning gibbous moon, as I said, just past full now, it's rising now at 9.51 p.m., rising at 9.51 p.m., and uh, it sets tomorrow morning at 9.20 a.m., 9.20 a.m. So if you're up in the morning at 7 and the sky is clear, if you look way over on the eastern sky, eastern side of the, I'm sorry, if you're up early in the morning, before 9.20, two hours before then, like 7.20 or maybe even 6.30, and you look over to the western sky, western sky, you'll still be able to see the moon as it hangs above the horizon about to set. So it's over there in the morning after sunrise over in the west, okay? So you can catch it tomorrow morning if you like. And the moon is new again next on August 16th. So new moon is coming up on August 16th, all right? So uh, we've actually just passed the cross quarter day. Uh, so if I can do this really quickly, let's see how this is gonna work out for us. Yes, right, we've just passed the cross quarter day known as Lamas. Lamas is the third of the four cross quarter days of the year. Now cross quarter days, I really like these, so I talk about them a lot. I mean, you know the basic season days, right? You know, the first day of spring, the first day of summer, first day of fall, first day of winter, right? Everybody knows those. But the cross quarter days, these are the days that are halfway between the major seasonal mileposts of the year. Do you know any of them? Yeah, you actually know two of them. Right off the top of your head, you know two of them. You ready for this? One is February 2nd. What do we normally call February 2nd every year? Oh, hopefully I won't be charged for using that music. I didn't use eight bars, so I guess it's okay. Uh, that day, February 2nd, we know of as Groundhog Day. Well, Groundhog Day is a cross-quarter day, halfway between the first day of winter and the first day of spring, right? The next cross-quarter day, that's halfway between the first day of spring and the first day of summer. Do you know what that one's called? Do you know what that one's called? Yep, you know it. It's May Day. May Day, the first of May, halfway between the first day of spring and the first day of summer. How about the one that's halfway between the first day of summer and first day of fall? This one is really obscure because we don't really celebrate it very much. It's called Lamas, L-A-M-M-A-S. Lamas really is a throwback to sky watchers and agricultural uh, farmers from uh, Northern Europe. So Lamas is left over from that. It's actually connected to a religious holiday as well, but that's one we don't know very well. Here's the last one that almost everybody knows. Between the first day of fall and the first day of winter. You know it? Can you guess it? Sure, Halloween. Yep, All Hallows' Eve. That's the cross quarter day. Cross quarter days are halfway between the season days that we know of, the seasonal mileposts. The year is divided up like this in the agricultural world or in the agricultural world of hundreds of years ago because it made it easier for farmers to understand when was the proper time to plant crops, cultivate crops, and harvest crops. And if you put this together with moon phases, then as it turns out, you have a pretty accurate sky calendar for when you should plant certain crops how long you should leave them before they mature, when they should be harvested, and how you prepare for the next season. So these two systems together, the moon phases of the year and these cross quarter days along with the seasonal days, 
gave a really, really cool clock that uh, farmers could use to figure out how they were going to do what they were going to do. So that's a lot of fun. Well, that's where we are. We just passed that cross-quarter day, and that cross-quarter cross -quarter day, of course, as I said, is Lamas, and Lamas occurs on the 1st of August, which was just a couple of days ago. And now, what's coming up next for us for a season? Of course, it's the first day of fall. The autumnal equinox is coming up, and that's off in September. We will talk about that a little bit more as we get closer to that. So what are we looking at in the evening sky these days? Well, in the evening sky, we have really cool stuff to see. Of course, the moon is up right now. You can follow the moon, but it's going to be rising about 45 to 50 minutes later every day. So if you go out and catch it tonight at 9.51 as it's coming up on the horizon, as it's coming up on the horizon, tomorrow night, you'll go back about an hour later be just above the horizon. And then same for the next night, the next night, and the next night. So as this happens, of course, you're now watching it later and later into the evening. And so that might become a little bit taxing because then it's going to be rising early in the morning before sunrise. Well, then you can just get up in the morning before sunrise and see a thin crescent moon over on the eastern side of the sky in the morning before sunrise. So why don't you try that? If you can spare some time since it's summer, maybe you're on vacation. Not a bad idea to try to watch how the moon changes its phases during the course of a cycle all the way around one whole month. That'll be cool, right? You can check that out and see how that works out. Easy to see, easy observation to make, and helps you understand a little bit about the mechanics of the solar system and how things work. Remember, the moon is in orbit around the Earth. Every day, it moves 129th and a half, 129 and a half, no, <laughs> I just call it 128. It's easy, more easily divisible that way. Okay, so it moves about 129th of its orbit every day. And you can see that. If you just observe at the same time every day, you'll see that jump from one day to the next of the moon in its orbit around the Earth. Fun to watch how that goes on. Okay, so the other thing that's happening with that, though, of course, is if you go out and watch the moon as it rises, when the moon is around full, can be the day of full or a few days before, a few days after, as the moon rises on the horizon, guess what? There is this illusion that I've spoken about before. It's called the moon illusion. It's an optical illusion that the brain actually perpetrates on us, if you will, that makes it seem as if the moon is much larger. It actually just appears larger on the horizon because our brain thinks, as we see it near objects of known size, like a tree or a building, it fools us into thinking that the moon is much bigger than it really is. It's really an optical illusion. So guess what this is very much like? You know the phrase supermoon? Yeah, well, it's like that. So you can actually sort of create a supermoon almost any evening you observe the moon as it rises at the horizon or sets at the horizon. It can appear to be much larger. And in fact, I would contend that it looks a little bit bigger or you can actually see the difference easier than you can on the night of a quote unquote super moon. Because when the super moon is directly overhead, it does not look any bigger. In fact, there's nothing for you to compare it to actually. So you can't really tell that a super moon is any bigger. You need something to compare it to size wise so you can actually see the difference. So that's hard to do. So I recommend doing it this way, right? Just catch the moon as it's rising on the horizon and you can make it seem super. Okay, enough about the moon. Oh, last thing about the moon. If you have a pair of binoculars, I really encourage you to get them out and take a look at the moon under that magnification. It's amazing the kind of features that are available on the moon. And if you'd like to learn more about it, NASA actually has a brand new website that they've opened just recently, uh, maybe a week and a half ago, that gives incredible observing details about the moon. And what it allows you to do is you can actually look at the moon for each day of its phase, you know, from beginning to end. And NASA gives you a map. I, sh I should say it this way. NASA gives you a photograph of the moon for that particular day of the lunar cycle. And they give you map indicators of where you can look for interesting things on the moon. 
either craters on the moon, mountains on the moon, or you can look for uh, historical places, markers on the moon where some of the Apollo spacecraft ha have landed. So give that a shot. That's, that's fun also. Uh, we'll get to the constellations in just a second, but let's check with Linda and see if there are any questions. Linda would like to know, when can she see the Perseid meter shower on the West Coast? Ah, thank you for that question. Minda, Minda is asking, when can she see the Perseid meteor shower on the West Coast? That's a great question. As it turns out, any astronomical observation, almost all astronomical observations that are made in one part of the world, uh, as long as it's in one hemisphere or the other, can be seen just later in the day in another part of the world. So for example, I'll use the Perseid meteors as an example. So for us here on the East Coast, Minda, the Perseid meteor shower is going to peak, reach its maximum of visible meteors on the night of August 12th to August 13th. So that's nighttime, August 12th, into the morning, August 13th, right? So let's say you, let's say the peak is at uh, 1 a.m here on the East Coast. Well, the peak of 1 a.m. here on the East Coast would mean three hours difference that we're talking about 10 p.m. on the West Coast. Now, here's the other thing though. If it's not quite dark enough, just wait a little while until the sky gets darker. You'll still have some activity going on. So it's three hours difference from here to there, Minda, but you'll be able to see it anyway without any problem at all. The delay in time won't have a major effect because the shower and the peak actually last for a number of hours, actually more than 24 hours. So if you catch it sometime in that 24 hour period, you're doing just fine, okay? So Perseid meteor showers, August 12th into the morning of August the 13th, peaks in the, that night, and the actual point from which the meteors seem to come from, the constellation Perseus, which is the reason why it's called the Perseid shower, that rises at about 11 p.m. in the evening over in the northeastern sky. So if you're out after midnight, you now have the radiant point, as it's called, the spot where they come from, now up above the horizon showing us more. So give that a shot. What else do we have? Well, we have a couple of a couple of other shout outs. So Yoon from West Philadelphia. Hi, So Yoon. Thanks for joining us. Kaylee from Cole Township in Pennsylvania. That's fabulous. Mark Anthony in South Philadelphia. Hi, Mark Anthony. Deborah in Philly, from Philly to Warren County, New York. Ah, I see. You go from Philly to Warren County, New York. Oh, that's cool. And Patrick in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hi, Patrick, out in Fort Collins, Colorado. This stuff is good for you as well. Yeah, no problem. Hopefully, you have darker skies out there, or you can get to darker skies a little bit easier. Uh, and if you can do so, that's a great place to do it from. Fort Collins, Colorado. Let me see. Isn't that where the WWV radio station is? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, you're looking for, uh, yes. Right. Great. Okay, good. I'm just getting my act together here. So uh, any other questions, Linda? Great. Then I'll crash on here. So let's just talk about what's available in the evening sky. Ah, thank you very much, Joy. My technical producer is really killing it here tonight. That's really great. If you take a look in the comments, you'll see that she has posted for us the uh, moon page that I was speaking of just recently, where there's this daily moon guide. Thank you very much. The NASA daily moon guide. This is a wonderful site because there's so much wonderful information. Uh, but you can use this every night to find those features on the surface of the moon. Thanks, Joy. That was great. Okay, so what do we have for summer constellations? Yes, well, here's what I'm going to do, folks. You know the website that I usually use for this? If you don't, let me tell you which one it is. The website I usually use for this is called Stellarium Web Online. Stellarium Web Online. And I like to use Stellarium Web Online because it's right there in front of you. It's easy to get to. And it's just easy for you to pick out. It's stellarium-web.org. Stellarium-web.org. Now, uh, this is an online app. Thank you, Joy. An online app that allows you to observe the sky as it appears tonight, but you can look at the sky from any place on the planet anytime you want to look. Those, it doesn't matter what time or what year. You can set all that. And in setting that, you can actually 
build a map for yourself or it will give you a map of the night sky and you can use that to learn your way around. I think that's really handy uh, because you can manipulate it. You can actually move around in it and you can see the sky as it appears, as I said, anytime from any place you want to look at it. So give that a shot. But here are the constellations I want you to pay close attention to. These are the main constellations of the summer sky. There are plenty of them out there. Oh, by the way, here's a quiz for you. How many constellations are there in the night sky altogether? Any idea? How many constellations are there in the night sky? It's more than the 12 you're thinking of. Let's see who comes in first. Yes. Linda just said, let's see who comes in first. How many constellations are there in the night sky? <laughs> For you musicians, I'll give you a hint. The hint is it's the same as the number of keys on a piano. If you have a piano in your house, quick, go count the keys. Okay. Aha! There's one. What do you have, hon? 88. 88. But two that came in, uh, Alan and Katie. Alan and Katie. There we go. There's Katie right there with 88, followed by Alan at 88. And there's Ann. Hi, Annie. Great to see you here. Thank you very much for that response. <laughs> Fabulous to see you here. Thanks a lot. And uh, Paul came in too with 88. Fabulous. 88 keys on the piano. Fort uh, Collins is the location of the atomic clock. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick McCloskey, for Fort Collins as the location of the atomic clock. Greatly appreciate that. So uh, back to the constellations of the summer that I really want you to look for. Here are the bright main ones. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven bright ones. Let's start out in the southern portion of the sky, the southern portion of the sky. What I mean by south is wherever you are, if you can figure out your cardinal point directions and just look in that direction, that's where I want you to see. I'm not saying you have to go south, although if you have a private jet heading down to the Caribbean, please stop by Philadelphia and pick us up, and we'll be glad to show you the sky from there. Uh, but if wherever you are, just step outside, point yourself toward the south. These constellations are seen in the southern sky. One of them is called Scorpius. The other one is called Sagittarius. Scorpius is shaped like a big S shape in the sky, a big S shape, which is convenient because the constellation is supposed to look like a scorpion. And the line of stars that makes the S shape actually outlines what would be the backbone of the scorpion. And in fact, there's also a bar of stars at the top of that line that sort of mimics, if you will, the head of the scorpion. And way down on the other end of the S, there's a little curl of stars that represents the curled tail of a scorpion with a sharp point called the stinger. So that constellation is really easy to see. It has a bright red star called Antares, and that's also easy to see. So if you're looking toward the south, this is one of the bright constellations. If you look for the bright red star, you're looking right at the heart of the scorpion, and you'll see the rest of the S on either side. This is after the sky gets dark, but don't wait too late, because here in the northern hemisphere, scorpion doesn't stay above the horizon for more than, a, oh, I'd say maybe eight weeks in the summer. So if you wait too late, it will have set down below the southwestern horizon. But if you can see where the scorpion is, as you're facing south, to the left of that is this other big bright shape, this big shape made of bright stars, I should say. This is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is actually supposed to be a, a centaur archer. You got that? Get that vision in your mind, a centaur archer. So if you could imagine the centaur from the Harry Potter films, and imagine that centaur as an archer holding a bow and arrow. This is what Sagittarius is supposed to be. Half man, half horse with a bow and arrow. Now, he's actually pointing the bow and arrow towards Scorpius. But thank goodness these constellations will never come together in the sky. So the scorpion is not really under any threat, but it just looks that way. So you'll see that in the sky. But guess what? That's not what the stars look like. Disappointing, right? I know. I wanted it to look like that, but that's not what it looks like. What it actually looks like is it looks like a teapot. A teapot. Yeah. With a spout, a top, a body, and a handle. 
Now remember, with this program, stellarium-web.org, you can actually add the lines of the constellation shape. And if you just do the lines, not the artwork, just the lines, you'll see the teapot shape. Then you can add the artwork and see what the centaur is supposed to look like. Okay, so give that a try and that should work out for you. Now, guess what? Here's the anchor for what's there in the night sky. It's Scorpius on one side, Sagittarius on the other side. Between those two, there actually is a faint sort of trail of what looks like clouds that comes up from the southern horizon and stretches up overhead into the northeastern sky. And you're actually looking at the arms of our galaxy, the arms of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And here's what I want you to do. You ready for this? This is a very cool thing to do. So you're standing outside. You're looking toward the south. You can see Scorpius and you can see Sagittarius and the Milky Way goes up between them. Even if you can't see the Milky Way, but you can see those two constellations, look in that direction. Then what I want you to do is extend your arms out to your side like this. And what you've now done is you've made a spindle, a spindle around which the galaxy rotates because the arms of the galaxy now are right in front of you going up overhead. So imagine this as a, as a plate or a record or a CD, and we're standing right where the hole is. And if you're standing right where the hole is and you look out along the plane or the plate that stretches out in front of you, the arms of the Milky Way we see in the galaxy represent that spiral that we are. And this is the spindle around which things are rotating. So you can actually see where the thickest portion of the galaxy is, and it's along the Milky Way. Going out to the left and out to the right, you're looking at the galactic poles, if you will. The North Galactic Pole on one end, the South Galactic Pole on the other hand. This is the spindle around which the, the galaxy spins. Isn't that cool? Imagine that, if you will. So that's what you can do there. Let's go to the rest of the sky. Let's come up from the South. We're going to look almost overhead right now. We're going to find three bright constellations, Cygnus the Swan, uh, Lyra the Harp, and Aquila the Eagle. The easiest way to locate these three is to do this. Look for the three brightest stars you see overhead. The three brightest stars overhead. Each one of those bright stars belongs to one of those constellations. The one that is the southernmost one is Altair. The brightest, const the brightest star in the constellation Aquila, Aquila the Eagle. That's the southernmost of the brightest ones. The one that is the northernmost one. Back over your head this way. The northernmost one. That one is Deneb in the constellation Cygnus. It's the brightest star in the constellation Cygnus. Yep, right. And then the last one is also quite bright, almost as bright as Deneb is. That's the star Vega in the constellation Lyra the Harp. Now, here's an interesting thing about the harp. This constellation with its stars doesn't really look like a harp. It looks instead like a parallelogram. Please remember way back to your days in geometry class back in the eighth and ninth grade, or maybe that gives you a headache or it's something you don't really want to remember. I can understand the trauma that could have, that could have caused. Anyway, a parallelogram. It's a box slanted because you've shifted the sides a little bit. Well, that's actually the shape of the stars, of the main bright stars of the constellation Lyra the Heart. And this one, Vega, sits off to the corner of one side. Here's what you do with your pair of binoculars. Lay yourself out flat on the ground, look up with your pair of binoculars, take a look at Lyra, just off to the side from the bright, I'm sorry, Vega, just off to the side of the bright star Vega, you'll see two other small stars, two other small stars right nearby. You ready for this? Each one of those stars is a double star. That's two stars together. So look for Vega with the binoculars. Off to the side, you'll see two small stars. Each one of those is a double star. And get this, those double stars each rotate around each other. And the pairs rotate around each other too. Wow. Amazing, amazing what's happening. So you can look for that with just a pair of binoculars. That's a cool sight to see and something pretty much unexpected, right? Well, there are plenty of double stars in the sky and that's one of the more famous ones. And you ready for the name? The name is the double, double, the double, double. 
Sure, because there are two double stars there together. So these are the three constellations right at the top of the sky. Cygnus the Swan, the bright star there is called Deneb. Deneb, that star is a really good distance away from us. Let me see if I can remember how far away Deneb is. Uh, it'll come to me in just a moment. Uh, it's well over a thousand light years away. Uh, it's really far out there. It's well over a thousand light years away. It looks almost as bright as Vega does. But guess what? Vega's not far away at all. Vega's pretty close to us, if I remember correctly. Uh, 16 light years away? These are all numbers you can look up easily without any difficulty. But that star happens to be really close to us. While Den Deneb is really far away from us. Let me get it straight now. Deneb is 1,600 light years away. Yep, there we go. 1,600 light years away. And Vega is only 26 light years away. So it's right here, right nearby. But they look as if they're the same brightness. And here's what I always like to say about that. If those two stars look like they're about the same brightness, imagine how bright Deneb really must be if it's as bright as Vega looks at just 26 light years away. And it's 1,600 light years away. Imagine we brought Deneb up to 26 light years away. It would be blazingly bright. We'd see it in the sky easily during the day. So plenty to see out there. Now, when you put these three stars together, what do you get? What's the geometric shape you get when you take three points and join them with three lines? Three points, three lines, try, right, triangle. This is the summer triangle, the summer triangle. And the summer triangle is easy to see even under city lit skies. So don't despair. If you live in an urban area and the sky is really bright from the city lights, you can see the summer triangle, and that will lead, at least will lead you to where those are. Okay, who found this for us? Oh, let's see. Happy to found you found this for us. Oh, Happy is from the Fairmount neighborhood right here in Philly. Thank you, Happy to found you. Greatly appreciate that. And uh, new to night skies as well? Hey, thanks for joining tonight. I hope you're enjoying this, and I hope you find it useful also. So uh, happy to found you, you, you. Great, thanks. Uh, that's really wonderful. Super, super, super. Okay, so now we've got those constellations. We're all good there. Let me give you two more that are to the right and to the left of those constellations overhead. Just to the right of the constellations overhead is the constellation Hercules, Hercules, shaped like a big H. If you use the star map to locate it, you'll be able to see where that is right there. But here's the reason why I want you to do this, because if you have a pair of binoculars, there is what's called a globular cluster. Easy to find. Easy. Easy. I mean easy. Easy to find under slightly darker skies in Center City, Philadelphia, with a pair of binoculars. So here's a challenge for you. Your challenge is use Stellarium dash web.org to identify the constellation Hercules. Zoom in on the constellation until you can find the globular cluster and where it's located among the stars of Hercules. Then go outside one night when you're someplace where the sky is a little darker and use your binoculars to see if you can see it. This is a real gem because this happens to be a cluster of stars, easily a hundred thousand or more all gathered together, gravity holding them together, uh, and they are attendant clusters of stars that accompany our galaxy as our galaxy moves through space. So these globular clusters are really cool to see. As I say, at least 100,000 stars. Some of them have as many as a million stars. And this is one that you can see without too much difficulty. So that's up there, just to the right of the three constellations we just named as part of the triangle. On the other side, going to the left or to the east from these, coming up later at night is the Great Square of Pegasus. That's another good one to get used to seeing because it's the key to a number of other really cool things to see in the sky. But it looks like a big square. Just look for that right now. Okay, we have talked a lot about what's available to be seen in the sky. Oh, I forgot to mention Saturn for you planet lovers. Saturn is now coming up late in the evening over in the east. So last night, two nights ago, uh, you would have seen it not far from the moon, but the moon has moved on in its orbit coming up later than Saturn is. So now Saturn is rising over on the eastern side of the sky, east-northeast, uh, after sunset, of course, uh, as the sky is darkening, 
uh, I say late evening. Late evening is good. So 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you'll see it over on the eastern side of the sky. Here's a cool thing that's happening. It rises a little bit earlier every night. Because it rises a little bit earlier every night, that means you can see it earlier, and it's also higher in the sky. So in a way, it's doing what I call backing its way into the evening sky. So pretty soon, in another month or so, it's going to be very well placed, high in the east, as the sky is darkening. So it'll be perfect place for you to observe with a pair of binoculars, or remember that telescope you got as a holiday gift, and you lazy bones hasn't pulled it out of a closet yet? Well, here's your perfect opportunity to do so. Saturn making its way up on the eastern side of the sky in late summer and early fall, great time to observe. So get your telescope out, dust it off, use Saturn as a, as a target to build up your skills at handling a telescope. Good way to do it. The moon is good for that too. All right, so that's what's out there planet-wise right now. So the Perseid meteor shower, yes, as I said earlier, thank you very much, Minda, overnight from the 12th of August into the morning of the 13th. Now, if you can't do it that night, that's okay, because as it turns out, the meteor shower actually runs from late July into late August, but, but the peak is on that particular night. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a stream of meteors that orbits the solar system. That stream of meteors is always in the same location. But the Earth is not always in the same location. This is when the Earth comes to the meteor shower. The meteor shower doesn't come to us. We come to the shower. So the shower is the dust, detritus, bits of rock, and other material left over from a comet that traveled along that path, melted out of the nucleus as it orbited the sun and warmed up. So now that dust and dirt is all out there. Every year at the same time, the Earth begins its journey through the path. It starts in late July, makes its way through to the thickest portion of the path by August the 12th, 13th, and then makes its way through with fewer and fewer meteors every day through the end of the month of August. Think of it as walking through a stream that you find in the forest. You start out on the edge where it's just kind of damp, gets wetter as you move further in, you cross the middle of the stream where it's deepest and the rushing water is moving at its greatest speed, and then you come out on the other side. That's what the Earth does with the stream of meteors that we call the Perseids. So you'll be able to see them throughout the month, but the peak is actually from the 12th to the 13th, okay? Don't miss it if you can manage to do it, because this year, it turns out, there's no bright moon at night. That makes it easy for us to see, easier for us to see. So make sure you do that. It's a great thing to do. It's not the biggest meteor shower of the year. It used to be. And the number that you can see typically is around 100, you know, somewhere between 80 and 100 uh, meteors per, per night. I'm sorry, 80 to 100 meteors per hour, per hour. This is under clear, dark skies with a great horizon, you know, if you can see all the sky. It's also going to help if you have a group of people looking with you because they happen all over the sky. You can't be looking all over all the time, so you may not count that many in an hour. But it is one of the most prolific showers of the year. It is second only to now the Geminid meteor shower in December. December 14th is the peak of that shower. So let me think, when would I prefer to be outside observing meteors? Would that be summer or winter? Hmm. I'm going to guess you'll say summer. Yeah, how about it? Because the weather happens to be nice. But guess what? If you like nice cool temperatures, like I do, winter is just fine too. So as long as the sky is clear and there's something to see, here's an opportunity this summer for something that's really cool to see. Uh, please don't be fooled by the uh, moniker you typically see of uh, nature's celestial fireworks. No, it's not fireworks. I don't want to oversell it. But it's still cool to see. So get out and see if you can see some of these. These are little tiny pieces of rock that are streaking into the Earth's atmosphere at thousands of miles per hour. And as they compress the air in front of them as they come in, the compression of the air heats that air until it becomes incandescent and it glows. And as the velocity of the meteor falling in slows down, that compression stops, the air cools off, the streak goes away and the material falls to the surface of the earth and to the ground. So uh, 
it's a great thing to see. Think about that as you're watching. Okay, folks, so, so let's get on to talking about, as we need to do, let's talk about careers in astronomy. You know, there are so many possible careers in astronomy, and I am really fortunate in that I have a really great career in astronomy. It's a little bit different from what you typically think of about a career in astronomy. So let's just do the basic things that people tend to think of uh, in terms of careers in astronomy. So first of all, the subject area we're talking about in science here is physics. It's physics. That's what we're talking about that. And this is a branch of physics called astronomy, which is the study of the universe and the night sky and the processes that make the universe what it is. So with an astronomy degree, you could be an astronomer. You could be an astrophysicist. You could be a cosmologist. So these are different categories of astronomy, if you, if you will. Someone that, uh, someone that studies the physical interactions that occur between objects, from large particles down to, from uh, very large objects down to very small particles, would be an astrophysicist. If you're a cosmologist, you're someone that is studying, actually, the origin and the fate of the universe. If you're a planetary scientist, you're somebody that's studying the planets, whether it be atmosphere or geology or formation or any of those things, you could be a planetary scientist. You could be a staffer at an observatory. Now, a staffer at an observatory could be a technician or a telescope operator or any kind of a technician that actually works with telescopes. So you could be an electrician, you could be a metallurgist, you could be an engineer of some type that works on telescopes, so much you could do, or you could be a staff scientist, someone who actually helps to reduce the data that's collected by telescopes and puts it into a format that researchers can now study that helps to learn something, helps to teach something about what we're actually observing through a telescope. And you have to think of it in all these different ways of parts and pieces that go into what astronomy is. So the other thing that you can do with this is you actually could be an optical engineer. You could be someone who actually builds equipment or devices or detectors that are used on telescopes to interpret the energy that's being gathered by the telescope. So let's think of it this way. You could be the person that is a telescope designer. So you could actually design this device that's used to gather information from the universe. So you could either work on the superstructure, you could work on the mechanism that drives it, you could work on the optics of the telescope, you could work on the control systems, you could work on the computer uh, equipment that drives the telescope and collects information. You could work on detectors that attach onto the telescope that then interpret the energy that's being collected. You could be a technician in the observatory operating the building itself. And the buildings can be pretty complex too. I bet you didn't know that in some observatories, the actual floor of the observatory rises and lowers to match where the detector attaches to the telescope. So if you're looking toward the top of the sky, the place on the telescope where the detector attaches might be very low, down close to the floor, down very, very low. But if you're looking at something closer to the horizon, that means the eyepiece of the telescope or the area where the detector attaches is up very high. How are you going to reach that? You're going to use an escalator, an elevator, a ladder? Well, no, you're not going to do that because you don't want to carry the equipment way up there. So what you might do is there's two ways to do it. You can actually put the telescope in a position so that that part of the telescope is down close enough to the ground that you can attach the device. Or you can actually move the floor of the observatory up and down to match that. And I've seen that in a few observatories. So there's all kinds of engineering that can happen there, right? Okay. So uh, let's see. So we talked about some of the technology, data scientist, data, database manager, software developer, uh, website designer, even website designer, and uh, so many other things that you can do. Just a moment. Let's go back now and talk about some of the things that might not necessarily be uh, exactly what you might think. I think I talked already about 
being an instrument engineer, someone that designs the instrumentation that goes on the telescope, mechanical engineering, I mentioned that, optical engineering, software engineer, or a systems engineer. These are all jobs that are connected to working at an observatory. So there are lots of careers in which you can apply what you studied for astronomy. So here's the side that I'm on, actually. I'm on the side of education and academia. So I do not work in higher education. I work in informal science education. The Franklin Institute is an informal science museum. That's the venue I work in. And this really gives me incredibly broad latitude. But in the education field, you could be an astronomy education researcher, someone who researches different methods of teaching astronomy and the effectiveness of astronomy teaching as it is today. You could be a curriculum developer, someone who works in a school system that develops the curriculum for science programs or science education programs. You could be the editor of a scientific journal. That's always a great thing to do because you get to talk to a lot of different people about what's going on in the field and you get to learn a lot about what's happening in the field. You could be a grant coordinator, a grant coordinator. Now, what is a grant coordinator? This is a person who pulls together all the work that's needed so that an observatory can actually get grant funding to build and operate the telescope to do astronomical research. So these big telescopes that we see around, they are funded through grant funding provided by the United States government often. And in doing so, you need someone who can coordinate that grant process. And don't forget that sometimes these projects are billions billions of dollars in size. So in order to do this, you really need someone who was well enough organized to pull all this stuff together and pull all the parts and pieces together to present the case of why an observatory should be built and you know what purpose it's going to serve when it is built. So that's that's something. Uh, design, IT. In formal science education, as I say, that's where I work. And the work that I do it's an amazing job. You've heard me talk about this before, but it's an amazing job. I get to do all kinds of really great things in astronomy, everywhere from working at major observatories around the world to working in our planetarium, designing and producing planetarium shows, working in our observatory, helping people have a, have a, a positive scientific experience with astronomy, which I find oh so gratifying. But there's so much more. There's so much more that can be done. Uh, my studio producer is reminding me what did you say about that you said website designer indeed yes IT, 3D design. it and 3d design yes there's all kinds of things that go into this uh thank you very much i will make sure i do that i'm just getting a little information from my studio producer here to remind me to do things uh so we talked about computer scientists data scientists uh you know if you're into finance guess what these are big operations with lots of dollars. So if you're into finance and you like astronomy, you could be a financial advisor. You could be a market analyst that helps with this. Uh, there's so many different things you can do. Uh, you could be, a, it, it, with that degree in astronomy, you can actually work in space exploration as a space science mission engineer. With an astronomy degree, you can be an astronaut. You can be a mission specialist for NASA on space exploration missions. Yeah, I've known plenty of astronauts that were actually astronomers that spent their time doing astronomy work on board International Space Station or on space shuttle missions. So how broad is this area? So broad, so many things you can do. But let's talk about something even further afield than that. Do you know that there's a place for for people at observatories and in this field, for people with medical skills? Well, what do I point that out? What do I mean by medical skills and how does that apply? Well, here's how that applies. One way in which it applies. Observatories are enormous operations. Typically, there are hundreds of people that work at an observatory covering all the bases that have to be covered for operation of a major science facility. So we need people in the kitchen, we need building engineers. We need medical personnel. 
Here's a really interesting part about the medical personnel. Some observatories are located at very, very high altitudes, say above 15,000 feet. Well, when you get above 15,000 feet, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere goes down by about 40%. So that means now that you're working in an atmosphere where oxygen is at a premium almost. Well, people can suffer altitude sickness, and that can be quite debilitating. So there's a strong need for medical personnel to make sure that the workers that have to work in these kinds of environments are well cared for and their medical situation is being monitored all the time. All right, so there's a lot out there. If you want to know more about this, I have a recommendation for you. Here's where you can go to find out more about this. The American Astronomical Society is an organization of professional astronomers around the United States that meet twice a year to talk about what's happening in the field. And this organization has been around for an extremely long time. They have great information on their website about careers in astronomy. It's easy to get to. It's just aas.org, aas.org. If you go to aas.org and go across the top to the menu, uh, drop down menu that says careers, if you jump into that, you'll come up with a really great sort of graphic, if you will, that shows you where you can work in industry, how your astronomy degree can apply across industry, across the research fields, across academia, and even into nonprofits. It's almost like I want to say it like this. Whatever your vocational interest is, what your vocational interest might be, if you have a strong side interest in astronomy, there's almost always a place where you can apply your talents in the field you want to really major in, in astronomy. There's almost always a place for you to fit somewhere, either at a big observatory or, you know, as a researcher or part of a team at a college or a university where all the research really takes place. There's so much you can do in this field, so many opportunities for you to not only cater to your interest, but also to chase your passion of whatever it actually is. So go check out that website. You'll find plenty there. If you have questions, please reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to help you and point you in a, in a direction. Uh, questions, right. Linda? No, three minutes left. Okay, well, so. Someone says Paul Frog had said you could be Elon Musk. Uh, thank you, you Paul. Like Elon Musk. You could even be like Elon Musk. Let me see, do I really want to be like Elon? Well, anyway, yes, I could be like Elon Musk. Thank you very much. Uh, and I could get to space easier that way? Maybe so, I don't know. Uh, anyway, thanks for that, greatly appreciate it, Paul. So uh, let me just mention that uh, coming up in September, I'm dropping a new podcast. It's coming up in early September. And uh, if you'll check out the Franklin Institute's website, beyond.fi.edu, you'll be able to find out a, more about this. My podcast coming up is called The Curious Cosmos, and it drops the Tuesday after Labor Day. So if you check that out, that's going to be a really great podcast, because guess what? Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to talk to a bunch of my friends in this industry about some of the fun and games we've had in this industry and what it means to us to have been part of it in all of the different things that we do. And it's everybody from astronomers to uh, astronomy educators to planetarium people to astronauts to everything. All people I know in this industry that have had a lot of fun in astronomy and always want to share that information with you. You'll learn a lot of really cool stuff and meet some really cool people. So that drops the Tuesday after Labor Day, The Curious Cosmos, my next podcast coming up. Please check it out. Okay, so let me just check and see where we are. We have to clean up here and make sure we've got everything taken care of that we want to take care of for this month. Don't forget the Perseid meteor shower, as I mentioned. You got the dates for that already. That's cool. If you think you'd like to go out and catch a star party someplace, if you're around the Delaware Valley here, the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers, they do a star party every month. If you check out dvaa.org, you can find out the information of their events, where their next one is. The Bucksmont Astronomical As Association uh, in Bucks and Montgomery County, uh, bmaa at bma2.org, 
BMA2, the number two, dot O-R-G. You can check out their events and find out when they have a star party. That's really cool. And don't forget the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. That's a really great bunch. Rittenhouse Astronomical Society dot O-R-G is their URL. Just as it sounds, Rittenhouse Astronomical Society all of those letters, .org, and you can find out what's happening with them. And if you live a little bit further out, up toward Allentown, the Lehigh Valley Amateur Astronomy uh, Astronomical Society, LVAAS, Lehigh, Val Lehigh Valley Amateur Astronomical Society, has an observatory at South Mountain in Allentown, LVAAS.org, LVAAS.org. You can go check them out as well. And let me also mention, if you happen to be out toward the Lancaster area, there is the Ryan Observatory at Muddy Run Park, uh, about 12 miles south of Lancaster, if I remember the numbers correctly. But if you look up Muddy Run Observatory or Ryan Observatory online, this is a great location that has really dark skies and they have a fabulous observatory location set up there. Joy, thanks for posting the link on that one. This is a really cool place. Uh, you really need to see this. It's the newest observatory that I know of, a, a, like a really serious observatory, built on the East Coast in like the last 60 years, maybe, something like that. It's a phenomenal place. It's a great drive out in the country. It's a beautiful drive out there, but go check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. OK, so now next month, let's talk about what's coming up next month. So next month, here's what we're going to do. The special event that's happening in October is a solar eclipse. It's what's called an annular solar eclipse for us here on the East Coast. It will be a partial. Only about a quarter of the sun is going to be covered by the moon, in this case, in the Philadelphia area. It's just about a quarter of the sun. But guess what? This is like a practice run for the big eclipse that's happening next april april 8th a total solar eclipse coming through the eastern portion of the united states not far from philadelphia you'll be able to get to totality but let's practice in october and here's how we're going to do that what i'm going to do is next month i am going to use this program to teach everybody how to host a solar eclipse observing event yes how to host a solar eclipse observing event. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you all the instructions and information you need for how to host a solar eclipse observing party. All right. So what I mean by that is if you want to get your family together to observe this event on Saturday, October 14th, I'm going to give you the information of all you need to know to plan for that. But if you're going to do something bigger, let's say you want to get your church group to do this, or you'd like to get a group at work, or you'd like to get a group at school, or any place like that, I'm going to give you the information you need to figure out how to do that, the logistics of how to do that sort of thing. I'm also going to talk about where you can get solar eclipse glasses. I'll tell you right now, it's the Franklin Institute. You're going to get your solar eclipse glasses from the Franklin Institute. Why? Because you can be assured that we have solar eclipse glasses that are safe. You don't have to question anybody else. You don't have to check online. You don't have to do anything like that because you know we would have the right ones, right? Because it's my eyes that are checking it for you, and I'm not uh, doing anything to jeopardize these. So if we say they're safe, they're safe, okay? And so you can get them from us. So we'll also give you other pointers about where you can go online to find all the information you need, where can you get maps, how do you photograph something like this? I'll have a special pointer for you about that and all the cool stuff you need to know all the beginning you know start times and all that kind of stuff everything you need that'll be at our next night skies at home so thank you very much for joining us tonight glad you could be with us for this edition the august 2023 edition of night skies at the observatory we'll be back next month early september the first thursday night of the month and we'll talk about the cool stuff that's happening in september then along with how to plan your own solar eclipse observing party. So uh, thanks for joining us. Don't forget, you want to get outside at night and take a look at the night sky. Enjoy what's there to be seen. Uh, even if the sky is cloudy on one night, don't forget the information that you've been given here is good for the rest of the month. And uh, don't even worry about the Perseids. If that doesn't turn out, well, you'll be able to see it a week later too. So just keep all that stuff in mind. Always great to be out under the night sky because it gives you a chance to reconnect with the universe. 
it's where we're all from. So uh, we're just one of the bodies whirling around in space. And it's good for us to know what's happening with all the mechanics of everything that's out there. Because you too can easily understand what's happening without any problem at all. And you can just enjoy the serene beauty of the night sky. So grab your binoculars, get your telescope, go outside, have a good time, enjoy the sky. And uh, remember, we'll take your questions here next month if you come up with some more. Did we get everything? We did. We have thank you shout outs from Holly, Mark Anthony, Magdalene, and you. Super. Thanks so much for joining us for Night Skies at Home. Glad to have you with us. Looking forward to seeing you next time. See you later, Annie. See you later, Minda. Thanks for joining us. So glad you were with us. And Annie, I'll talk to you later about Buffalo. See ya. Thanks for joining.